is um, I've got a mic which I'll come around um, and if you can just wait if you do have a question if you can put your hand up so that I can get to you with the mic because if it doesn't go into the mic then nobody on Zoom will be able to hear it and won't be in the recording. Um, and then once we've, depending on how we're going with the questions in the room, then we will go, I will go over to Zoom and call out some of those questions as well. Who'd like to start? Any questions? Um, I guess uh, just from a practical point of view, um, if we think about today sort of being like a meeting, what would be the kind of action items that we could all kind of do individually, um, myself as a person with IH, like just in terms of, um, you mentioned you can't grow research, without growing researchers and how to get people interested, what might be like a doable action item that we can do individually? Sorry, yeah, I've just explained that I'm deaf, so. <laughs> I who who exactly would you like to answer the question? So, Prue, if you could just give me an idea of the question. So the lady's question is around research and if this was a meeting for the day, what would be the takeaway to-do list for, so how can we um, as a community um, help in the area of research? So, yeah. so, not, so not so much related to research, but you know, I was talking about drugs and, you know, and things and part of it's sort of changing the culture. So you know, post-election, once you know, you know who your local member is, Go and meet with your local member. Yep. Tell them what IH is and Absolutely. tell them what living with IH is. Because in the next 12 months, from a professional body point of view, we're going to be going to politicians with proposals and coming to the patient support groups for sort of the stories. But if members of parliament already have heard something from local people, like, oh, yeah, that's that thing. And it's just on their mind rather than it being just something that's totally foreign. So the more different angles that people are sort of hearing things from, the more traction we're likely to get. Yeah, actually, I agree. And I'd add to that that that's what I tell people in Tasmania um, where there are no sleep specialists um, that are even interested in narcolepsy and IH now. And I say to them, oh, sorry, there isn't anything I can do, there isn't anything the ASA can do. They can't make doctors go down there and live in Tasmania. But you can speak to your local member and make them aware of the fact that you have to come all the way to Melbourne for um, testing and um, treatment. So, yeah, absolutely speak to your local member. The only thing I'd add is there's, t there's two funding sources or government funding sources for medical research. One is the Na uh, National Health and Medical Research Council, which basically funds simply based on the type of scheme and, you know, how people rate those particular applications. The other one is the Medical Research Future Fund, which is, a, is, up until now anyway, has been heavily influenced by who lobbies the Minister of Health. And I think to some extent that still will, will occur. And therefore, whoever is the Health Minister after May 21st is, is someone, you know, you need to badger that person because they have, have funded um, all sorts of, un, let's say, less prevalent conditions. You know, it's not not just, you know, I don't know, dementia and stuff like that. It's 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 all sorts of conditions. So I think it, it is one politically sensitive form of funding. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, my question is to both of the doctors. Um, I've got narcolepsy type 2 and a major issue is the insomnia induced by the stimulants. So I'm just wondering what some of the current recommended ways of managing that would be. If, if, if money were no object, you know, I really like sodium oxalate in narcolepsy. Um, but money's real and... You know, that's, that's a real consideration. And so that becomes a, that's a really common problem. Mm -hmm. So narcolepsy type 1 and type 2 to a lesser extent are often characterised by sleep fragmentation and insomnia. It's often one of the key symptoms. 
and it's yeah, how to manage that. And it ends up being very individualised, trying to work out how much maybe the stimulant might be driving it versus how much maybe just sleep fragmentation as part of the disorder. Really like um, Sarah's talk is you know is there coexistent hyperarousal? Lots of people I see with sleepiness conditions, you've got to push harder just to get stuff done. So you're often just running on you know, chronic stress model just to get through life. So sometimes just backing off on that background hyperarousal can make a difference with sleep. And sure, I've got my little tricks of odd drugs I'll try, but it is really individualised and there's not a standard approach. I'm not going to answer with this guy behind me. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask him the question? Professor Eves de Villiers, would you like to comment? Do you hear me? Yes. We can. Yeah. Hey. Happy to be with you today. It's very early for me, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't make it. But uh, next year I hopefully will be with you. So, sodium, to answer the question precisely, sodium oxybate in narcolepsy type 2. Um, it depends if there is a very bad sleep at night, and that may be related to orexin deficiency, even if it's NT2, namely without cataplexy, if he did not measure orexin. But uh, to uh, improve the nighttime sleep, uh, sodium oxybate is very key, is one of the best drugs for narcolepsy. To treat EDS, we do have other drugs, and for NT2, there is no cataplexy, so it's not uh, the issue. So, uh, but all other uh, hypnotics uh, propose to fight against bad sleep at night with uh, sleep maintenance, insomnia, number of shifts, decrease of slow wave sleep, and so on. I think it's uh, it's 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 not a good option. The best option is just sodium oxybate in this way. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, what practical advice, I suppose, would you give to partners or, um, I guess, people close to those with IH um, specifically, um, as, and from all points of view, I guess, so um, psychologically, um, clinically, and um, even lived experiences of things that you've done with, um, I guess, or had uh, done for you uh, for with partners or family members, um, people with IH? Um, well, I guess if you're asking the question, you're somebody that cares in the first place, um, which is not what a lot of us mm. have. So if we're starting from a place from somebody that actually cares, then the best thing that you can do is to listen and accept the fact that there are things that... that um, your partner may not be able to do, but there will be times when they can, and not to question that. It's not about, oh, well, you could do it yesterday because you might not be able to do it today. But if we're looking at it at a, from an angle of, you know, what well, a lot of us have had to cope with where we've got partners that don't believe us or um, don't accept it or truly just don't care, then that's a lot harder. And... Um, yeah, I don't have a particular answer for that. I, I actually say that you should cut as many toxic people out of your life as you can. That's the first step to um, doing the best thing for you. So, yeah, but thanks for caring for someone with IH. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I really, again, I, I really like Sarah's sort of premise of the nurturing, depleting stuff, and that comes a lot from Jason Ong's, Ong's work. So one of my learnings from insomnia and running, running sort of residential retreats for people with insomnia, is the partner says in the morning, how'd you sleep last night? And it's like, you know that thing you shit at? How bad were you at it last night? So often the way we show care is someone who's sleepy going, you know, how sleepy are you? How's your sleepiness today? So reframing that as a what's your, what's your nurturing activity today? So there's no talk about sleepiness. The talk is about what's the thing you're going to do for you today? because we have trouble giving ourselves permission to do that self-care. So if our partner's holding us accountable to do the self-care, that actually is really supportive. I love that. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the lady in the audience, just for those online, she said the way to um, combat that is to bring your partner along to these types of conferences for awareness. Thank you. Yeah, I think education is very important. It's frequent that I'll have partners come along to sessions for education and to navigate some of the sort of complexities with, you know, running a household and life, um, you know, with someone who's persistently sleepy. And um, I, I totally agree with Michelle that, you know, sometimes we have to prioritise about, you know, who serves us in our lives and there can be lots of painful decisions around that as well. So we want to sort of educate and nurture and um, support those people who are in your court and then there might be just some people who, you know, you're, you're, you don't have the time or energy to change. I think, I think there's the other point was the responsibility of the medical carer. Probably, I think David would agree that if you're going to tell someone that your diagnosis is narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnolence, you don't just tell the patient, you make every effort to try and contact if, you know, if they have a partner to actually talk, talk to them. You know, it's a bit like you know, any, any illness, you really need to kind of bring them in early and say, this is a real condition and this is the background and, and that sort of stuff. And that has, I think, may not solve the, the most toxic partner, but it may help some. if I would have gone home with my diagnosis, um, if I'd got it on my own, um, it would have been a lot more difficult than when I went home because my husband was with me when I got it. it was huge, huge difference, I'm sure. Having doctors and medical um, professionals uh, explain that to your family members or your partner is so different to you trying to explain that to them. It kind of validates what you've been saying because I know for me it was always, oh, you're a bit of a hypochondriac. I'm sure you're not as tired as you always said you were. So having the doctor actually explain it was really validating. Thank you. Um, just over here. <laughs> Hi, my name's Nevin. I'm a GP with an interest in the area. Um, this question is more for the clinicians, I suppose. I know about the uh, narcolepsy genetic test, the HLA test. Um, how likely is it for narcolepsy to run in families? And is there any evidence of IH running in families? And is there a genetic basis for that? I mean, he's written papers. Eve? I, 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 I could... Yes, I, I can answer that. So for narcolepsy, it's rare. It's, it's, it's rare familial condition. Narcolepsy is uh, 2 5%. The HLA just for sporadic cases is to destroy or exit neurons by a autoimmune process. So this is for NT1 narcolepsy. For IH is uh, often by clinical history, there is a, a, a relative, a parent, a sister, a brother affected with the same complaint. But in very rare cases, unfortunately, so far, the, uh, this patient has been recorded uh, by PhD and a good uh, clinical interview and so on. So <coughs> the detail of the familial history is not well done, but we, I do believe in my experience that one third probably are uh, from familial cases, but for the genetic part, uh, we find almost uh, nothing striking for a diagnostic test. Uh, there is some uh, interesting evidence on circadian rhythm from uh, um, few genes that then may be involved in uh, triggering the disease, but is is you need a lot of patient to compare to controls to look for this uh, association. So for a given subject, unfortunately, so far, there is not a, one candidate that may help for the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the risk to, uh, uh, to have a familial cases if you carry this allele. So uh, unfortunately, we need more money uh, and more uh, time to, to answer your important question about the genetic background. We work on it, but uh, 
there are some uh, animal models, you know, uh, from Japan, the Yanagisawa group report the long sleep in some mice that may mimic IH. So we work on that and uh, hopefully next year we will have some results. Yes, hi, I had a question for Dr. De Villiers as well, please. Just around how did you manage to um, centralise so much expertise um, in one centre and create sort of this superstar team and thinking about how lessons we could learn in Australia where we have a smaller population and we live in kind of big cities that are quite far away from each other. How could we then apply that to centralise some of the expertise? <coughs> Thanks for this uh, nice uh, comment. Uh, so in France, there, I'm very lucky because uh, 10 years ago, there is a big uh, government uh, initiative for rare disease and sleep has been involved in for narcolepsy and related disorder, including IH and, and Klein Levy. So the, the organization of the health uh, system uh, has been really uh, driven by this effort on rare disease. As you can see that uh, in France is uh, well known and in my domain is the brain team for sure, uh, belonging for a brain disorder. And uh, I'm running uh, the reference national center for uh, this narcolepsy, IH and klein -Levin syndrome. So I, I do have this expertise because it's well organized and a patient come uh, from France to see me when they are, so it's a biases because they are mostly severe and accepted to to uh, add a lot of exam to not just to treat them but also to understand the disease and the prognosis and the severity so i have been in, in, invited by my friend uh, ron grunstein uh, several years ago in sydney and hopefully uh, we can it was mostly on narcolepsy at that time several years ago I cannot remember if it's three four five but uh Hopefully next next year I could make it and uh, to organize not a real bridge because it's very far away. Uh, but uh, if you can a little bit copy and paste what we uh, are doing, it could be a, a, a nice effort. Thanks, Michelle, as well, to invite me. But really, I would I would have come to to be with you, but it was impossible uh, that time. But next time, uh, hopefully, yes. I think I'd add, add another point. I mean. The highlight, highlight of Eve's visit was going to the A-League soccer final, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, you must have been appalled by the standard compared to France. But anyway, um, the other thing too is there's been a like a tradition of narcolepsy research in Montpellier for I'd say centuries, probably Eve, um, but um, right. a long time. So it, you know, there is that sort of. It's like why we have a strong sleep apnea group, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so it takes time. The, the way around it, I think, is what, like he's suggesting, is there are um, funding sometimes for networks so that you can actually grow. I mean, I think in Australia you can't just have one, one centre, you need, you know, two centres or that sort of thing. You probably need to grow it. So, again, it's these sources of funding like MRFF where they, you, if you could try and get a network uh, grant for s sort of central disorders of, of, of sleep, sleepiness, that would be one way of lifting the game, yeah. Um, this question probably goes to everyone. Um, talking about building um, expertise and knowledge, is there a way to do that on the ground for those of us who are looking for a specialist, a psychologist, or whoever it happens to be, to assist us in our journey with these illnesses? Is there somewhere that we can start a list of specialists who we know have other patients with IH or narcolepsy, psychologists who have experience so that we're not having to do that shop around? Is that something that's 
do it's often where patient support groups are really good for things like that because you can word of mouth can help you start a list but then it will become you know your preference I suppose it's a bit like with medication no offence but not all health professionals you know will treat that everybody but that's where I found a really good place to start was with some patient support groups yeah Another comment about that is um, for rare disorders, most of the time patients will know more than their healthcare providers. And so don't necessarily feel like you've got to find a healthcare provider who knows more as your everyday sort of healthcare provider. Like there'll be times when you need to access someone with, you know, expertise to answer a particular question. But a lot of the time you just need a partner to navigate the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for a GP, you want someone who's just going to be on your team and work with you. And then you can do the... Up, they don't need to be a GP that knows about idiopathic hypersomnia because GPs are expert in a whole range of navigating the healthcare system. That's part of their expertise. And they can do, manage that part. You can fill in the facts and the gaps about your particular rare disorder. So that, that's the tricky part too. You know, part of what Ron was talking about with the classification of respiratory and sleep positions, you know, part of why that's important because if you look at regulatory websites and look, you know, all of physicians who do any respiratory or sleep are all come under the same bracket. So you can't use those sort of databases to do that. It's a bit hard for us as a professional to body to go, well, go and see that person but not that person. So that does come a bit back to some of the word of mouth from, from patient groups sometimes. I also think that if there's one probably perverse benefit of COVID has been the growth of telehealth. And so, you know, you're not prevent if you're in Perth and, you know, you want a second opinion, you're not prevented from calling David up or whatever, you know, like, I mean, uh, you're going to get some sort of communication. And I think that's probably another way for less common conditions for expertise to be available nationally. Yeah. It's often the case within each profession as well. So in psychology, uh, there's sort of a, you know, a group of sleep psychologists who have an interest Australia-wide, but then also I'm connected with psychologists in Queensland as well, typically, that um, you know, have some, some interest and some expertise in sleep. So I think sometimes it, you, know, you, you can be sort of then referred to, to people that are more you know, who might be suited to you. So I agree. I think um, your patient advocacy and support groups are a really good place to start and then often you can be sort of connected with the team through that process. I do also think that if you join the Sleep Disorders Australia and you look at all of those um, speakers from yesterday, you may find people there that you will resonate with who will have strategies that you think, yep, that may work for me. question about erexin um, and family history. My mum has narcolepsy and my daughter who is 11 um, years old has had the genetic testing done and, and has the genetic the DCLH gene um, who, who shows a lot of features of possibly having narcolepsy um, and I wanted to find out if there was any research on um, whether they test erexin levels how um, you can tell in a younger child whether you know they've had a certain amount of erection and, and then it's depleted over time is there anywhere that we can go to get it investigated would that be useful for research um, yeah I guess that's aimed at probably anyone up there <laughs> I mean I, I'd be interested what Eve has to say but you know lumbar punctures aren't sim you know necessarily simple as you know sort of procedures and you've got to have you know, a rationale and it's it's not like a blood test sort of thing. Um, I mean, you know, I guess places that do a lot of research like like with it, uh, Montpellier, it's a, it's, it's a little bit lot more routine. But, I, you know, I don't know where, from Eve's point of view whether maybe French patients are more enthusiastic about lumbar punctures. <laughs> Do you, do you offer them wine, perhaps, <laughs> or Provence or something like that as an incentive? I'm not sure. I could offer something like that. I don't want to do it. Okay. I don't know. So, the, 
the way to uh, motivate a patient to have ALP is really simple because it's a brain disorder. Uh, if you look for blood, in most of cases, you are out of the scope. And if, even if you look for cytokine, as an example, uh, associated a lot in other subjects, as you know, uh, how can you be sure that the inflammation is just in the periphery or also in the brain or in both comp uh, compartments? So I think it's uh, just explain that there is no another way to look for brain problem, imbalance, the consequences of having loss of orexin or even normal orexin, about norepinephrine, uh, about uh, the GABA, about the dopamine, uh, all of what I did say in my two talks, if you will listen to that. So it's uh, easy to say that there is no other way so far with the techniques, uh, hopefully that may change time to time, but right now it's impossible, first point. Second, it takes two minutes only to do the job is a very uh, simple uh, uh, method. So we do that in routine for many conditions, you know, meningitis, uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, so it's very two minutes. There is no safety concern, zero. And, and right now, since 2014, the ICSD 3 hopefully uh, add the criteria for our vaccine to categorize the subject because, you know, I didn't spend too much time on narcolepsy because I was not supposed to do so, but cataplexy is not very, it's not always easy uh, to say if it's present or not. Sometimes it's not at all, sometimes it's yes for sure, but a lot of patients are in between, in, in the gray zone, because cataplexy are rare or atypical, because unilateral, or very long, or with a triggering factor. So it's not always easy, especially in kids uh, as well. So to be sure that they are affected with orexin deficiency, that will be again a chronic disease uh, for a lifetime. Uh, I think it's the only way to, to, to play with that and to answer the question. So for other conditions, it's we need also to move on and to understand what about uh, the neurobiology problem in this uh, subject, what about the chronicity, because I, as I mentioned already in my talks, a lot of patients do not have any more IH after 10 years of uh, disease duration. This is less than half, but 40% uh, probably uh, uh, improve a lot and even sometimes can be normalized. So uh, this is the only way to categorize uh, uh, the patient, and when we were, will be able to do that, hopefully next time we will not need to do that again. But right now to separate what is without long sleep time, with long sleep time, with NT2, all of this bridge and continuum we work on a lot, I think uh, there is no alternative uh, right now. So it's just to help uh, the patient to understand better the disease and, and next to propose a personalized medicine. I do believe that a lot. And when you do believe that a lot, you, if you educate and you explain to the patient, they will follow your advice. So uh, I think uh, the most easy way is to explain and explain and explain where we are, where we want to go. And uh, it's enough to motivate most of patients to uh, follow your advice. This is what I do in routine in my lab. Thank you. We've got quite a lot of questions online. So I'm just going to ask one from online and then I'll come back to the audience. So um, we have a gentleman who's <coughs> asked, what level of understanding about hypersomnia is apparent in NDIS and other support agencies? Is hypersomnia recognised under secondary and tertiary student access plans here in Australia? So the, I can talk a bit about um, NDIS stuff. Um, so, so well, let me go to the university stuff first. So the universities vary from university to the university, so that's not consistent. But I must admit I haven't had with people with either narcolepsy or hypersomnia major issues with the universities. They seem to be fairly um, accepting. Um, you know, that's different for employers that 
can often be a bit more problematic, but universities. The NDIS, I, I, it's really hard. Um, I really find both NDIS and then separately to NDIS Centrelink undervalue the impact of hypersomnia and IH on people. Um, it doesn't map to those sort of boxes you've got to do to score points to get a disability support pension. Um, it doesn't map to a clear diagnosis that then allocates you to be um, sort of eligible for NDIS. And NDIS is going through its own identity crisis about is it a disability service versus what part of health does it cover? And that's really tough. So short answer is nothing as yet, but obviously with awareness and more research and recognition, hopefully that will change. We'd hope. Yeah. It is extremely difficult and I find uh, whenever I've had to advocate or write letters, it's very much based on, on functioning. So yeah. kind of being able to map in, in a typical day, what does that look like? The, you know, and it's various areas of function, social, um, occupational, um, psychological, all those sorts of things. So although it doesn't map with diagnosis at all, it, it is, I guess, being able to demonstrate all the various ways in which these conditions impact functioning. But it's very hard. I agree, Centrelink and um, NDIS, most very hard to get over the line. And actually, so just to I'll talk a bit about what both Fiona and Michelle talked about was acceptance. So if I look at the natural history or sort of post-diagnosis and how people I see at least progress over the first few years, it's very common to almost be trying to fight against the diagnosis for a year or two, mm -hmm. then to develop a degree of acceptance and then to develop the working with it. And often that'll manifest in how the things I get asked for. So it's not uncommon someone might make a diagnosis, try to work full time, find they can't do it, and then at the six month point I get asked, you've got to, you've got to sign me off for the DSP. But that can't work 15 hours a week, whereas a person's only tried to work 40 hours a week, because they've been in that mindset, if it's all or nothing, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to fight this thing. Whereas with them, with some acceptance and a lot of the strategies Sarah's talked about, people can actually function better um, and may not need to be looking at a DSP or might not meet the DSP criteria. So it does matter all, it determines a bit, you know, what phase people are in, in their relationship with how they're trying to work with their symptoms. Which I think also ties in again with how people experience it differently and the severity of, you know, I've navigated that path myself. So I am on the DSP because of my narcolepsy. Yeah, so it is possible, but it's a long road. Perversely, easier with narcolepsy than idiopathic hypersomnia, for all the reasons Ron talked about. You know, people have heard that term before, and like Eve's talked about, it's a concrete, demonstrable, acquired orexin deficiency, and you can show biomarkers, yeah. whereas idiopathic hypersomnia is more symptomatic, not that clear biomarker. Assessors haven't heard that word before. You know, it doesn't ring a bell. Thank you. Oh, yep. Um, this is, I think, originally just a question for Dr. De Villiers. When I saw on your slides, it said um, spontaneous remission. Um, I've done a lot of research into IH and sleep disorders, but I've actually never been even told or saw that it's possible to have a remission in that area, or um, if you could just touch further on that or any research that's been done into that. Yes, thanks for this important question. Uh, there's two ways to answer that. First is how to diagnose and is based on the PhD MSLT, the long sleep recording. And if you do and redo the same test, the first is to uh, uh, confirm the diagnosis with positive criteria. And if you do the same job, same uh, uh, workup, uh, several years after, and the, the, the criteria are no more there, you cannot say that the patient is still affected with the disease. First point. Second point, we do know that the, 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 there is some variability between the tests, especially for the MSLT. 
So if one day is seven minutes and the day after is nine minutes, or we can make even more complex, 7.8 minutes and 8.2 minutes, you know. And the same for SOREM, one is one SOREM, the second one was two SOREM. We do see that in routine. So in one way it's positive criteria, the other way is negative criteria. So it's not based on the patient, it's based on our um, exam that are not very stable and robust. So this is the second uh, point is the variability of the way we assess the patient and we need to know that to be sure that is we will not make a wrong diagnosis if the test is not exactly what they are supposed to be. And third is the patient complaint. I may have start with that, but I wanted to be again to confirm that the diagnosis need to be objectively assessed as I uh, details in my two talks. So the, the third is the complaint. The complaint is complex to be assessed because the patients are managed, are treated. So it's impossible to say if they may be uh, in good uh, fo uh, follow-up, in good uh, evolution perspective w uh, without any medication because they are managed already. But we do that for several uh, conditions, you know, uh, one is pregnancy, you need to stop the medication. Second is trial, when you pay, uh, uh, ask the patient to be in a trial. We did that for low sodium oxybate as an example, or, or they need to stop the medication. And third is <coughs> if you want to uh, stop the medication and to go to another one, could be pitolizan, could be whatsoever the name, if you want to to, to change the medication. I often go for a window of eight days without any medication to go back to normal, to avoid the mix up about the withdrawal of the previous medication and to start the new one. So there is several way that we ask the patient to be without any medication. And when we do that, we record the, the polysomnography again because it's a nice opportunity to, to look for this natural history because they will be free of drugs. And in this way, in one third, 40% of subjects, depending if it's with long sleep time, without long sleep time, they improve a lot and sometimes even recover. And, and, and the first, uh, so, so the last point is the age effect. Uh, when you, uh, reassess the patient five years, 10 years after the first uh, uh, diagnosis test, you know, the natural history of the sleep propensity and the percentage of slow wave sleep is hugely variable with the age and you decrease a lot of your sleep propensity and your percentage of slow wave sleep, the end three. And that may explain also that you recover, you know, young subject at 20 years old, uh, are very sleepy. If you put this patient in a bed, you know that, that they may wake up at 11 a.m., uh, 12 sometime. So if they complain about sleepiness and fatigue, why not? Are they are affected with high age, but it's not, uh, uh, you know, it's not high age. It's just because they are very, uh, they are young and they may have more um, uh, sleep uh, uh, demand uh, at that time. So the, the evolution in this way is could be very uh, positive, but if you are affected at 40 years old or 45 years old, the chance to be uh, normal five years after is very low. It depends also when you diagnose the patient, mostly it's 20, 25. And if you reassess the patient five years after with the different uh, example I, I, I gave you, it may be normalized uh, in, uh, in some of them. And that's also of interest to explain that to the patient To Like for insomnia, you know, you can recover and it's of interest to say that you can recover from IH. I do see this patient as well. Thank you. There's quite a lot of questions online. So uh, what are the treatment options available for severe sleep inertia 
Some speakers mentioned this is often worse than EDS for people with IH, but there is nothing available. Can I um, answer that? For, well, the doctors will be able to tell you if there is any other medication than I know of, but I don't think there is. But what I do to help with um, sleep inertia and sleep drunkenness is actually take my medication before I wake up. And I mean before I wake up. So I do it horizontal. I've learnt how to use a pop-top water bottle in my sleep. My medication is left out in a medicine cup. And while still horizontal, I take my medication and the water and I remain asleep until the medication wakes me up. And I've been doing that for so many years now that I can't imagine how I'd wake up without that routine. But it takes a human to wake me the first time or to nudge me to have that medication. So a human has to watch me take that medication. So that you, if without having somebody there to help you wake up and if your medication doesn't help like it does for me, then I don't know what the answer is or if there is other medication, but that's what I do. I mean, there's efforts in, um, I guess, pharmacology to actually, you know, you create these delayed release uh, medications and there's a number of examples but I know that there's been a paper on that for caffeine for example where you could take it before you go to sleep but the actual release is delayed until you know much later so I think you know there are advances in that area that will potentially create medications that can help with sleep inertia as Michelle had said, I find this one of the most troublesome symptoms for people and the hardest to manage. So, Eves, I was wondering about your experience. You know, I'm always interested in the paper you guys published on use of sodium oxabate in people with IH. Not the low sodium oxabate clinical trial, but prior to that, the case series where you gave regular sodium oxabate um, in some people with IH just as a single dose. And, you know, I, my reading was you showed some difference in sleep inertia in that subset. Yes, I, I think that uh, in my experience, there is just two ways to solve that uh, when sleep inertia is very severe and you need to manage that with drugs. The first is low sodium oxybate. All sodium oxybate is the same. It's just uh, less salt, but the same uh, oxybate mechanism of action. And it's it's very effective because of the short half-life and the patient will be wake up spontaneously, you know, after three, four hours after drug intake. This is the reason why they can wake up uh, easily in the middle of the night. We do have a lot of expertise with narcolepsy for our 20 years. And in IH is more different because it's a little bit different because they mostly they have less dose. It's not nine grams, it's mostly six to seven grams. And sometimes once at night is enough. I don't know exactly the reason why, because the half-life is very short. Again, is uh, 0.5 hours, so 30 minutes. So after three, again, three, four hours, there is no more uh, oxybate in your brain. So you will wake up. So really, it's effective. It reduces total sleep time, and it decreases sleep inertia, believe me. This is the first... Uh, uh, not the first, but one, one option. The second option we use in the past a lot is immediate release uh, uh, methylphenidate, uh, 10 milligrams. It's, uh, it's very effective, not very effective, it is effective when there is a bed partner that may help you to wake up and to take these pills. Because if you are alone, you cannot wake up because of your sleep inertia. So if you take no drugs, you cannot fight against these symptoms, so you need some help. And to take a drug at night, a stimulant drug at night, like modazinil, methylphenidate, I'm not sure is a good option because your sleep will be poor, you will decrease uh, your slow wave sleep, you will increase your sympathetic drive at night, that's not good for your blood pressure and not good for your sleep at, as well. So I'm not sure it's a good option uh, and I'm not sure as well that that will really wake you up uh, because except amphetamine, amphetamine may uh, wake you up, but all of the wake promoting agent did not wake you up. Really, believe me, it did not wake you up. 
it improve your ability to uh, be alert and to be awake when you are awake. But it, it's not increasing your release of norepinephrine and dopamine, it's just inhibiting the, the recapture uh, uh, of this uh, of this neurotransmitter at presynaptic level. So there is no real increase in your release of uh, wake neurotransmitters. So I'm not sure it's really effective. And last, some colleagues use melatonin at night. There is no good studies on that, and uh, it may work uh, if sleep inertia is not very severe, or if you have a little bit uh, sleep delay uh, face syndrome as well, that is often the case uh, for young subject uh, affected with IH. There's a, there's a paper which, um, I think it's in press, on use, like there's a Australian researcher, Cassie Hilditch, who now works for NASA in California, and They've been looking at bright, immediate bright light on, on awakening because obviously the military and space, you know, race and all that sort of stuff, they're interested in sleep inertia. So I haven't read the paper, but um, I know that it's, it's out there. Behaviourally, some things to experiment with potentially <coughs> would be certainly if there's a delayed sleep phase, so you're a night owl, perhaps working to just gently bring your natural wake time a little bit earlier if you possibly can. Uh, light, absolutely, and perhaps um, grading how you manage your morning in terms of behaviourally. So it's useful if there is a bed partner or family member who can help sort of nudge you awake. Um, but also maybe it's a matter of I'm going to start with just sitting up with the light on. Then I'm going to move out of bed and then and kind of breaking up that morning portion into these smaller goals that eventually sort of involve getting up and moving kind of down the line. But it can be quite difficult to go from, from woe to go. It's like anything, it's a slow process, isn't it? Uh, we do have a lot of questions online. So we have just discovered that we can um, get a copy of them. We can print a report. So perhaps if we give those to Michelle and she can distribute them, maybe? Something like that? I have multiple um, problems, as in uh, with, along with IH as well. So I have Graves' disease and, you know, the specialist said you should take that medication it's better to take it two hours before anything else. So I have an alarm that wakes me up at four o'clock in the morning um, to take that medication so that, you know, if I get up at six or a bit after and I have to go out early, then I can take my um, armadaphanil or nidigil or whatever it is. But the thing is, is that, like, because I've had also a heart attack and whatever, I can only take the nidigil. And so I can't take it first thing in the, in the morning because if I've got to go out later in the day, it's not going to work for me because it doesn't really work anyway. Like I had a big day travelling here on Friday. I've had a big day yesterday, big day to today. I'll probably, like I will just sleep through that, uh, my medication. It just doesn't work, really, unless I do nothing. So I don't know how to function. I don't know what I have to do to try to, you know, work or, you know, or do I qualify for the, you know, the pension? You know, I just oh. don't know. I'm lost because that's what I've been told. All I can take is modafinil and really, or, uh, you know, Nuvigil because I can't remember. Like, I was on modafinil, but I could never remember whether I took the medication or not, you know? So now I have to stay with the, the Nuvigil or Armadaphanil because I know that, and hey, there's some days that I think, oh, did I take it this morning or was that yesterday I took it? You know, so I don't know anymore, <laughs> you know? I don't know where to go. I've just moved from Newcastle to Queensland a couple of months ago. I can't even find a doctor that, that um, seems to know anything about anything, and um, yeah, 
So, um, as I said, like, you know, I don't know how to function anymore. But yes, really feel for you. Um, hopefully you've got something out of today and, you know, between Hypersomnolence Australia and their sort of network, there are medical practitioners in the room who work in Queensland. Um, and so you hopefully you'll be able to make some connections and find someone who can give you some good advice and help. Yeah, as Ron said, though, you know, of all the things that happened in the pandemic, telehealth's now a permanent part of the Australian healthcare system. That's for GPs, not specialists. Psychology telehealth items are permanent now too, regardless of you know, where you're based. I think it's very much it's very much individualised. You know, it's your plan is going to be very different from the next person's plan, and that plan probably will change over time as well. You know, depending on what's going on with your health and your circumstances, and so I think being able to access and connect with supports and a team is really important. Thank you. Um, my question's kind of a little bit more for Michelle and Fiona and maybe a bit Sarah as well. Um, because of the way IH and narcolepsy are and how it can be very personalised depending on the person, do you have any advice for people who might be new to this kind of diagnosis and how to kind of navigate being your own advocate and being assertive, particularly with medical professionals who, you know, have a whole world of experience in medicine? Um, every month we have a living with idiopathic hypersomnia chat and it's online, so we see each other's faces, which is a big difference to a Facebook group. Um, we get to know each other and we share our experiences. Um, but it never ceases to amaze me that every month there was somebody will come along with interesting to say the least stories about what their doctor has told them. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to share our experiences about what is right or wrong. Like some doctors will tell them that, like specialists will tell them that they're the only ones that can prescribe their medication and it can't be prescribed by their GP, which is not correct. Um, but it, all this time they've been spending a lot of money going to their sleep specialist. Um, they would not really been having a very good experience with it either. Um, they would really like to see um, their GP to get their medication because they feel more supported by their GP, but they never knew until they came along that they actually could get their GP to prescribe their medication. So um, coming along to things like that, to our um, support group, is a perfect opportunity to ask questions face-to-face, -face, or although over video, but rather than in a Facebook group of somebody you don't know, a faceless um, profile, you know, we make sure that everybody uses their video. It's very um, safe and a, a nurturing environment, and that's, that's what I think is probably the best thing. And you mentioned new. Um, Michelle is new to our community, and... Um, she's now uh, helping us facilitate our living with um, idiopathic hypersomnia um, chats because I thought that it was um, a good idea to have somebody new come along so that she would know what position someone else is new within rather than me because, yeah, I'm at a different stage. So, yeah. Can I just interrupt, Michelle? How much time do we actually have? Okay, all right. Um, hi, um, I was just wondering, um, I had really quickly about the spontaneous remission. Um, I was just wondering um, about, because obviously there are those uh, circumstances in which people would be taken off the medication. Um, is there any sort of clinical recommendation around how often a sleep physician should potentially try and see, you know, I guess like I, I had my mum ask me, oh, well, you know, you should, 
why don't you go off your medication? How do you know if you haven't spit, been in spontaneous remission? How do you even know because you're medicated, so you can't even tell? So that sort of phrasing, is there any sort of recommendation for physical, you know, removal of those drugs at any interval? No. It's, it's very, it's very individualised. Yeah. And I think it'd be, it'd be fair to say none of these drugs are perfect. Right? So I don't think I, know, I manage anyone with idiopathic hypersomnia who says, I don't know whether I've got it anymore because the drug's totally masking my symptoms. Right? It's there. Yeah. And so people just get a sense if it's there, but it's not, a, not there as bad when I'm, when I'm on medication. Okay, awesome. The, the other sort of clinical observation is often, the, often people are telling me when they feel like they don't need the medications or it's by natural attrition, they just sort of find that there's odd days they not taken it and the sky didn't fall in and there's more days they've taken a bit lesser medication. So it'd be quite uncommon where I'm the one telling people that they should do that. And it's often either people have observed that the background symptoms have changed a bit because the symptoms don't completely, sorry, the medications don't completely cover them or they've noticed their own use of medications changed. Um, and my other question was about, um, I know that there is an incidence of comorbidity between ADHD and um, IH. I was just wondering if anyone had any uh, insights into how to balance that kind of really crazy yeah, space that people who have ADHD and IH live in where you're either way too much or not enough and you can't really operate like a normal human being in any way. <laughs> sort of complicated in a way because if you've got un, you know, like unstable sleep um, you can have an ADHD like picture and I mean the classic is you'll see that in, in kids with sleep apnea often they're diagnosed with ADHD so it does depend on whether what's the basis of the condition I mean and you know is it the classical sort of ADHD prefrontal cortex sort of problem or is it, you know, something something else? So I think the only issue there is often the management is, is the same, you know. So it's 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 quite a com complex issue. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't I don't know whether there's actually very good research uh, considering potential overlap there. I don't know whether. Others or Eve. Yeah, Eve, have you got any comments? It's something I struggle with clinically because sometimes I find the stimulants might help some symptoms but aggravate others, yeah. other symptoms and add to a bit of a sort of a roller coaster. Again, you know, money, no option. I think sodium oxabate would be a good choice of drug in that situation. And any tips for us, Eve? Um. I think that the attention deficit in ADHD could be uh, overlapping the symptom of IH. Agree with that. Uh, for the impulsive, the hyperactive component of ADHD, I'm not sure that uh, it's really an issue in patients with IH, except if they are sleep deprived. And that's an, uh, an often question uh, we need to to solve and challenge because if you sleep too much, uh, 12 hours even more, you cannot uh, deal with your daily life because you need to work to, with different occupation with your family and so on. So you will all of the time sleep deprived for the former IH with long sleep time. And if you are sleep deprived, you can be a little bit impulsive and hyperactive to fight against your sleepiness during the day. So you need to uh, to discuss a balance between the to have enough total sleep time, but not too much because you will lose your day and your work and your uh, occupation. So uh, and you can uh, do a sleep diary on your weekend days and weekdays and uh, and to uh, to find with the patient a cutoff to uh, avoid this. Uh, 
this sleep deprived. I think sleep deprived NIH subject is really an issue and that may drive some symptoms that cannot be really uh, the core symptom of IH, but could be because of uh, associated sleep deprived for the form with long sleep time, I want to say. Thank you. I've got a question online which a few people have asked. How do we manage fertility with IHD? Easy answer. You need to stop all the medication. Methylphenidate, modafinil, Nuvigil, sodium oxybate. It's too much risk, not for the, the, the lady, but for the, for the, <coughs> the, the kids at the end. So it's, uh, there is a nice paper, and you need to know that, because a lot of colleagues, uh, even in France, use modafinil for narcoleptic uh, woman pregnant uh, patient because they say it's very safe. But there is a paper in JAMA from Germany's group uh, last year or two years ago showing that the incidence of uh, malformation is two, three, four percent and is 2% in met with methylphenidate and 2, 3, 4% with modafinil. So a largely higher, 2, 3, 4 times higher than the 1% prevalence in general population in Europe. So uh, I think uh, there is no option to stop. And in this way, you can reassess the disease, that an opportunity, and you can explain and tell your patient that is a good opportunity for the first trimester because after it's not really natural history because there is two hormones uh, there, but for the first trimester is okay. Thank you. I had a, another question for Dr. De Villiers, please, around combination therapy of stimulants in IH. How do you make that decision? What do you optimize <coughs> before going from one stimulant to considering two? And what sort of combinations, um, given you've got a good war chest of medications? Yes, that's an excellent question. And uh, there's two uh, ways to answer. The first is, which symptom do you want to treat? You never want to treat a disease. You want to treat a symptoms. Uh, so is it EDS? Is it sleep inertia? Is it long sleep duration? Or is it comorbid condition, such as depression and uh, other stuff like that? So you, you really need to, uh, to, uh, to look for which symptom do you want to treat. And second point is which association is the best. So again, it depends on the symptoms you want to improve. And also depends on the mechanism of action of the drugs. And also to have a good benefit risk profile for a long term. Uh, to avoid the cardiovascular problem, and I, I spent time in my talk on that because this is really key because you will expose the patient for decades with drugs. So if you can combine sodium oxybate and uh, 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 dop dopamine uh, uh, inhibiting uh, transporters such as uh, modafinil, methylphenidate, and other, it's good. This is one option. Uh, sodium oxybate plus a uh, stimulants or weight promoting agent and pitolizoids of interest as well there is no studies on that there is one trial that will start with harmony bioscience in us in the next few months but so far there is no uh, good evidence based uh, uh, to use it but clinical experience show that it may work as well and it's different mechanism of action because it's histamine so but it's the same for narcolepsy. I, I don't want to, to uh, combine drugs with same mechanism of action, except for a pharmacokinetic profile. Sometimes you can use immediate release of one drug and long release of another drug to, to, to combat with the, the complaint uh, all, all along the day. Hopefully I answer your question. Thank you. We have time for one short question. Only because it's your first time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of talk um, about drugs and um, what we're doing to treat our 
IH and our symptoms. But I had a, a question about sort of general health and well-being, um, which came up a bit yesterday. Um, given that a lot of us um, live quite sedentary lifestyles and we spend a lot of time horizontal, um, there's not a lot of exercise that goes on in this room, I'm quite sure of it. Um, how do we manage that sort of increase in potential cardiovascular risk, um, type 2 diabetes, things like that, when we really have trouble functioning, like getting out of bed, managing children, workplace, things like that. What sort of, I suppose, what should, sort of emphasis should we be putting on our time to manage diet, exercise, these, you know, these major pillars of health, and what sort of, sort of, I suppose, outcomes is that going to help us with long term um, in managing our health and in some of our cases, you know, our longevity? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to open it to everyone, please. Can I just answer quickly because I'd like to hear what the doctors have got to say. Um, I think the first thing that we need to do is actually educate doctors that our health is impacted um, by our other symptoms. And I think that's the problem first, is that there's so few doctors that are aware of IH and the impact that it has on us and everything that you mentioned. So that was part of the reason why we had the Sleep, Health and Wellbeing Expo yesterday. Um, both Ron and David has mentioned how um, sleep is not valued and that's almost the catalyst of all of the issues that we have. So, um, yes, I created that expo yesterday to, as a starting point so that we can get doctors to be aware of the importance of all four pillars of health and how it will impact anyone, whether they have a chronic illness or not, but particularly if they have a chronic illness. So. Um, that's, a, a, again, I really like Sarah's approach. Um, again, that's the role for a, a good GP that's not expert in IH but expert in managing health and well-being. You know, thinking about health longitudinally, thinking about someone's health in the longer term and all the different domains of health. So again, you know, we're coming back to you know, how do you find the healthcare provider. Again, it's a GP who's going to be taking that sort of long-term working with you type approach. Can I just say that that is a really hard task? Yeah. <laughs> really really hard to the point that I have like given up many times and just right so I now I go based on what I have learned over the years I guess and what has trial and error worked for me um, and almost just manage my own yeah, yeah. it's really difficult yeah. yeah I cried for a week when my GP retired yeah. Yeah. I literally cried for a week they I didn't know what I was going to do they don't want to know yeah. So I, yeah, I, I certainly get it. It's tough. Yeah. The, the other part is, you're right, you know, you correctly identified all the problems. People with chronic illnesses of any type, be it IH or be it other things, can't get away with neglecting other areas of health Absolutely. in the way that um, people with good health, you know, can sort of get away with not having to manage their broader health without it having as much of an impact. probably change as well over time as you know as your needs change as your children get older etc as well and that's why you know the GPs I think the whole um, doing the holistic approach 
And everyone's different again. I know when I came into my diagnosis, I was a runner prior and had exercise was a big part of my life. It was also a big part of my mental health as well. And I know for a fact that if my mental health is suffering, I don't cope with symptoms very well at all. It exacerbates them. So that's just me though. Um, you know, it's not to say that that's not a struggle for me each and every day to try and fit that in. But I think that's where GPs are valuable because, you know, go to them about um, like a health, uh, allied health, you know, a plan, like to see an exercise physiologist, to see a physio, you know, people that can help set that ball rolling because that should be a priority and, and not there with you and your troops. Yeah, as, a, as incorporating it into, yeah, and I mean, and take it, you know, don't get, um, don't get hard on yourself if you're not getting it every day or you're not able to do it all at once because it's a trial and error thing um, to work out where your balance lies within all of these things like the sleep and the nutrition and the exercise and that. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and I like the, the take-home points both Michelle and Fiona had about, you know, it's on us as, say, medical specialists making a diagnosis to tell people, yeah, there's treatments, but the treatments aren't perfect. Mm. There's going to mm. have to be some, some changes here yeah. um, because that might shorten that time period of, okay, I'm, life's just going to go on, it's going to take this magic pill and I'm just going to keep on going to the, well, I'm going to have to rearrange some things here and I'm going to have to just look at yeah. the, the bigger picture. Of course, the acceptance and the um, grief and loss and adjustments all part of that, but they're called a pillar of health for, for a reason. I guess I'd suggest that these things are sort of like the foundation of the building. It's hard to function well at work and it's, and it's hard to manage a household and so on if we're not really taking very good care as best we can of these pillars of, of health. So again, you know, when your energy is a precious and limited resource, I'd say it's worth investing it in these foundational things because you might find it has a bit of a flow then sort of up the hierarchy anyway. And it's not easy to advocate for yourself, especially with health professionals, but if it's really, you know, if it's something that's very important to you, I know I work, have worked hard, really hard with Claire, you know, to, to get her to understand how vital my mental health is in regards to my symptoms and what I need to do to get, you know, to work towards that. So speak up, yeah, you, you need to speak up until someone listens. It's not easy, I know, um, but yeah, that's one of the struggles I think that's universal for all of us when it comes to, to health professionals. But we don't want to give it up. Look at the ones that are here today, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just ask each of the panel, is there one thought that you would like to leave our audience with today? Oh, sorry, I got distracted. My 96-year-old mother just lost her keys and I'm... <laughs> <laughs> That's my thought at the moment. Um, we could start at the other end. <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll start at the other end. <laughs> sorry. I guess the most important thing that comes to my mind is that your condition's real and it's impactful and, you know, ideally you want to have supports around you who get that and are on your team and want to help you. If that's not the case, then, you know, I guess we want to try somewhere else you know, or, or ask others who they have found um, understands them and advocates for them. So be persistent. Keep trying. Thank you. Um, so for me, knowledge, knowledge is really powerful. And, you know, one of the things I love hearing Eve's talk about is there's stuff happening. Mm. This isn't just, uh, right, we've got this drug today, you're going to take that for the next 50 years, bye, you know, see you later. There's a lot changing in this space and there's a lot coming in this space. So really be informed, don't sort of take it as, oh, well, there's nothing people can do for me, this is my lot. So mm -hmm. really sort of take that knowledge and take some hope that there's, there's a lot going on. Thank you. 
Um, mine would probably be one size does not fit all. So don't compare yourself to others, um, what someone else can do, and you know you feel that you can't do because it just sets you up for failure. And again, it's just putting those expectations back on on ourselves that we don't need. Because I think every single person, as you've just said just there, is the most strongest. Yeah. Um, and just reflect back on that when you doubt yourself. You know, look back at how what you have achieved and how far you've come with that. So, and just take one step at a time. Celebrate the journey. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle? Um, I agree with what Sarah and David said. Um, also, I suppose there's probably a few things, but just briefly, remove toxic people from your life. Um, they will drain you of whatever energy you have and it just won't be worth it in the end. You are the, pers the only person that knows what your needs are and you need to give yourself what you need and don't expect it from others who just don't care, basically. Thank you. I was going to ask if someone found ready the now? keys here, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a waste of time in Sydney. Um, look, I'd, I'd echo a lot of things. I think the last point about overall health is, is, is probably something that needs to be made. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think... Nothing's worse for me than seeing someone who's got, say, narcolepsy or IH and then develop sleep apnea because they gain weight. And, yeah. you know, I'm not saying it's not easy to do something about it, but, I mean, it's something... And then you've got another cause of, of sleepiness that you've got to contend with. So, I, you know, but I'd echo what David said. It's a, it's a lot brighter um, therapeutic... Um, sort of sphere now than it was when I first started practising. Thank you. Professor de Villiers? Yes, uh, I make some comments. Uh, we work a lot on this area because there is a lot of stigma. Uh, patients are lazy, are drowsy, are just slow, and we cannot accept that. So we work to recognise these symptoms as a, as a disease, and this is the first step they are affected with the disease. And we need to understand better the outcome, the biology that may driven this disease and to help the patient with medication. And if we understand nothing about the pathophysiology, it will be hard to provide the best medication to do personalized medicine. So we work a lot on that from symptoms uh, first. Uh, and when you recognize symptoms as the disease, that help a lot for the patient. It's, they are no more lazy. They are affected with the name of the disease. And after you can educate, explain, and treat. And that will solve most of the problem. Not all of the problem, for sure, unfortunately. But it is very helpful. So I'm happy to... Uh, uh, explain that to you today and hopefully next year or in two years I can uh, discuss face to face with you to this very emerging fields because the overlap between all of this uh, NT1, NT2, NT3, NT4 and IH1, IH2 I think it will, is a starting point and uh, we, we will know uh, more and more for sure in the next few years. Unfortunately, not a lot of teams work on that, but uh, there are some, and uh, we will uh, we will find something to help you uh, better uh, soon uh, for the patient. I want to say many thanks uh, for your invitation again. Thank you. I just want to say on that optimistic note, my mother's found her keys. <laughs> <laughs> the way to end the day. <laughs> so on behalf of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy community, I would like to say a huge thank you to Michelle Chadwick for hosting this event. Your passion and drive for the advocacy of hypersomnolence disorders is second to none, and I know that many people here have personally benefited from your experience and knowledge and that you have given so generously. Thank you also to all of our speakers and to all of our panellists for their commitment to being an advocate in this space. 
for generously sharing your wisdom and knowledge. I'm sure our audience have learned a lot from your presentations. Thank you all in the community for your attendance. I hope that you've learned a lot today and that it serves you well in your sleep journey. Safe travels home.